Hello networking enthusiasts. Today I'd like to show you an absolutely fantastic tool that will blow your mind away. It's called FRP, Fast Reverse Proxy. You will say, we already have Engine X, AJ Proxy, Traffic, Caddy and Envoy. Why do we want another reverse proxy? Well, FRP is not a typical reverse proxy. It's a combination of a proxy, VPN, load balancer, TCP stream multiplexer, you name it. Let me show you a few things it can do. You'll be impressed, trust me. My name is Philip, let's dive right in. Let's begin with a simple scenario. You have a Linux server on your local network running a service that you'd like to access remotely. However, the server is behind a NAT and doesn't have a public IP. No problem, right? You can just install a VPN solution like Zero Tier, Tailscale or any other VPN on the internal server and access it from the remote client. But what if you want to expose the service to everyone, not just those with VPN access? Well, the typical solution is straightforward. Configure port forwarding on the firewall to make the service available to the internet. But what happens when you don't have a static IP or your router is managed by your ISP, leaving you without the ability to make configuration changes? This is where FRP, Fast Reverse Proxy, comes into play. FRP allows you to expose your service to users outside your local network, even if you can modify your router settings. So how does it work? First, you will need a server with a public IP. For this demo, I will be using a free tier VM from Oracle Cloud to run the FRP server component. Let's start by creating the FRP server configuration file. The first parameter to configure is the server's listening port. Keep in mind, this port is for your backend nodes to communicate with the FRP server, not the port that external clients will be using to access your service. By default, FRP uses the TCP protocol. If your cloud VM is protected by a firewall, you'll need to allow traffic to this port from your backend servers. Alternatively, you can open it to wider internet, but in this case, it's essential to ensure only authorized backend servers can connect. To secure it, we'll add an authentication token as a second parameter. Every backend server must present this token to connect to the FRP server. Now that our server configuration is ready, let's start the server using the command frps-c followed by the configuration file. All right, our FRP server is up and running. It's listening for incoming TCP connections on port 7000. Now let's move over to node inside our local network where the service we want to expose is running. Here we'll be setting up the FRP client. The client will create a tunnel to the FRP server and this tunnel will be used to forward traffic to external users. Let's start by creating the FRP client configuration file. First, we'll specify the FRP server's IP address followed by the port. Now let's start the client and see if it connects to the server. To do this, we'll run the frpc-c followed by the configuration file. As expected, it doesn't work. That's because, as I mentioned earlier, the client must provide a token for authentication. Without the token, anyone could connect to the server. Let's add the token now and restart the FRP client service. Great, the connection is established. Before we move on, let me show you something. If we stop the server, the client will automatically try to re-establish the connection. However, if we stop the client and then try to start it again, while the server is down, it will fail to reconnect. Let's add one more parameter to the client configuration. This will ensure the client keeps retrying even during the initial connection attempt. Now, if we start the server, the connection will be established automatically. Next, let's run our application. For this demo, I will use Netcat to listen on port 1234 for incoming TCP connections. Now, back to the client configuration file, where we'll define our first proxy. Every proxy we configure needs to start within the proxy section. Let's give our proxy a name. Let's call it proxy1. Next, we'll specify the proxy protocol. It could be TCP, UDP, HTTP, HTTPS or other depending on application type. In this case, we'll use TCP. Then we'll set the local port that our application is listening on, which is 1234 for this example. Finally, we need to define the remote port. This is the port that will be exposed externally by the remote cloud VM for clients to connect to. Let's use port 2345 TCP for this. All right, let's start the FRP client with the updated configuration. It shows the proxy started successfully. 
Now, if we check the remote server, we can see that it's listening on port 2345 TCP. Let's connect to the remote IP from my home PC and send some traffic. If we look at the local server, we'll see that it received the message. To help you understand the flow, here's a diagram. We have a VM on the local network with a Netcat application listening on port 1234. This application is only reachable within the LAN. Then we have a cloud VM with a public IP running an FRP server that listens on port 7000 TCP. Our local VM runs an FRP client, which establishes a connection to the FRP server. Only our FRP client knows the authentication token, so only the client can connect. Once we enable the proxy, the cloud VM began listening on port 2345 TCP. Since this cloud VM has a public IP, it's accessible to anyone on the internet. Here's how the traffic flows. A client on the internet sends traffic to port 2345 TCP on the cloud VM. The traffic is forwarded through the existing connection back to the FRP client, which then passes it to our application through the loopback interface. It works like a standard reverse proxy with one key difference. Instead of the server connecting to the client, the client maintains an open connection to the server. Let me point out a few important considerations. First, on your local server, you won't see the original source IP of the request. That's because the request is coming from the FRP client, which is running on the same server. Next, by default, the connection between the FRP client and the FRP server isn't encrypted. However, we can enable encryption. Let's stop the FRP client, open the configuration file and add transport encryption. FRP uses AAS128 CFB as the encryption cipher. Now let's restart the client. Next, we'll sniff the connection between the FRP client and our application. Since both are on the same host and communicating via the loopback interface, I will capture traffic on the loopback interface looking for a hello string. Let's initiate a connection and send the hello string. As expected, we can see the connection is not encrypted. Now let's sniff the connection between the FRP client and the FRP server, again looking for the hello string. After initiating the connection and sending the data, we can see that there's no hello visible on the wire, confirming that the connection is now encrypted. Keep in mind that enabling encryption can impact performance. To demonstrate, I have an FRP server running on my local network. Let's switch to our client, and this time, instead of using Netcat, we'll run an iperf server. I will stop the FRP client and update its configuration. Instead of pointing it to a remote VM, I will have it connect to a local hosted FRP server. We'll also disable encryption for now. Let's start the FRP client and run an iperf test without encryption. The result is around 700 megabits per second. Now let's change the configuration to enable encryption and restart the FRP client. If I rerun the test, you'll see the speed drops to around 400 megabits per second. Of course, the VM I'm testing with are running on low power ARM CPUs. With more powerful CPUs, you'd likely see less of a performance impact. Another feature you can enable is payload compression on the tunnel between the FRP client and FRP server. Let's stop the FRP client, open the configuration file and enable compression on the tunnel. Now let's restart the client. This time I will run the speed test again, but instead of sending random data, I will configure iperf to send a repeating pattern to demonstrate how well compression works. Keep in mind, the more random the data, the less effective compression will be. See that? Even with encryption enabled, we are still getting excellent results due to compression. Of course, compression will eat up CPU. You should only use it in low bandwidth or mobile connections or when the data is highly repetitive. On a high bandwidth link, enabling compression will have the opposite effect. Could slow down the transmission due to additional CPU processing required. So far, we've seen that FRP allows us to expose a local service behind a NAT to the outside world. This is particularly useful for exposing services like SSH. The tunnel between the FRP client and the FRP server supports features such as uh, auto-reconnection, authentication, encryption and compression. Now let's take it a step further. I'd like to attach another VM running our application and configure the server to load balanced traffic between the VMs. Let's go to the first application server, stop the iperf server and start our dummy netcat server. 
Next, I will stop the FRP client and open the configuration file. I will revert the previous changes and point the client back to the external FRP server. Now let's create a load balancing group and name it group 1. The FRP server will then load balance traffic between all backends that belong to the same group. We'll also set the group key. This acts like a password. Any FRP client that want to join the load balancing group will need to provide the same key. Ok, let's start the FRP client. Now, I will go to node 2, which is our second node, and start the application. I've already prepared the FRP client configuration. It's identical to the one on the first node. It points to the same FRP server, uses the same authentication token, and belongs to the same load balancing group with the same key. The only difference is the proxy name, which I've set to proxy2. Remember, the proxy name identifies a proxy instance and must be unique across all instances. Let's start the FRP client on the second node. If I check the FRP server logs, we can see that both proxy1 and proxy2 are registered under the same load balancing group. Now, let's connect to the public endpoint and send some traffic. Alright, the first connection hit node 1. Now, let's rerun the connection. This time, it has hit node 2. Let's now stop the application on node 2 and rerun the test. Despite the application being down, the traffic still reached the server, resulting in a connection refused error. There's an easy fix for this. We just need to enable health checks from the FRP server. I will open the FRP configuration file on node 1 and set the health check type to TCP. This means that if a TCP connection to the service can be established, the service is considered healthy. Next, I will set the health check interval to 10 seconds, which determines how often that service will be probed to check if it's healthy. The health check timeout defines how long to wait for the connection to be established. Finally, the health check's max failed parameter indicates how many unsuccessful probes are required to mark the backend node as unhealthy and remove it from the pool. Let's start the FRP client on node 1. Now, I will repeat the same configuration on node 2. After that, I will start the application and restart the FRP client. Ok, let's stop the application again. We can see that health checks are starting to fail. After three consecutive failures, the proxy status is marked as failed. If we look at the FRP server, we'll see that proxy2 has been removed from the pool. Now, if we establish few connections and send some data, we'll observe that the traffic is now directed to node 1. Of course, if we check node 2, we'll see that the health check is still probing our application that is currently down. Once we start the application on node 2, it will be placed back in the load balancing pool. You can also secure the exposed TCP or UDP port to ensure only authorized clients can access it. Here's how it works. Both the client and the internal server hosting the service run fast reverse proxy client software. These FRP clients connect to an FRP server, which is hosted on the cloud VM. When a client wants to access the service, it connects to the local port of the FRP client. The FRP client then passes the traffic to the FRP server, which forwards it to the second FRP client running on the internal server. This client then delivers the traffic to the actual service. It might sound complex, but it's actually quite simple to set up. Let's start by configuring node 1, which is our internal server hosting the application. First, we'll remove the previous configuration, leaving only the connection to the FRP server. Next, let's create a new proxy, uh, which I will call Secure Proxy 1. For this setup, we'll use the STCP proxy type. S stands for Secure or Secret. Unlike regular TCP proxies, an STCP proxy requires authentication to access. Now, we'll provide the secret key, which the remote client will need to access the service. Remember, the add token protects the connection between the FRP client and the FRP server, while the proxy secret key protects access to the service itself. Finally, we'll set the proxy port to 8080 TCP, which is the port our service will listen on. After saving the configuration, we can start the FRP client. For this example, I will run mini HTTP server as our service. Now let's switch to the client machine and configure its FRP setup. We'll remove any proxy configuration and set up the visitor section since the client will be accessing the service. As we'll be acting as a client, we need to specify that in the visitor section. I will name the client Secure Proxy Client 1 and we'll use the STCP protocol here as well. 
Next, we'll specify the remote proxy name, which is Secure Proxy one and enter the secret key that matches the one on the server side. We'll also configure the port the client will listen on for incoming connections. Additionally, I will change the listening address to accept connections from any IP. By default, it listens only on the loopback interface, but we want to allow access from external sources. Once the configuration is saved, we can start the FRP client. Now for the final test. I will connect from my PC to the client, and voila! My web browser sends a request to the FRP client on port 8080, which forwards it to the FRP server through the secure tunnel. From there, the traffic is routed to the second FRP client on the internal server, where it finally reaches the hosted application. Keep in mind, node 1 and node 2 are VMs on two separate private networks. By using a publicly available VM as the FRP server, we established secure communication between those two VMs over the internet. As a bonus, I'd like to demonstrate something really cool. In the previous example, all traffic between the two VMs was routed through the public VM. But what if I told you that in many cases it's possible to establish a direct connection between two VMs behind a NAT? This is known as peer-to-peer -peer mode. In this mode, both FRP clients connect to a STAN server, which helps them discover their public IP addresses, the type of NAT they are behind, and how their NAT is handling port mappings for outgoing connections. Once both clients know their public IP and port, they attempt to establish a direct connection completely bypassing intermediate servers. This approach uses UDP tunnels. I've already set up a configuration to demonstrate this. Here's a VM hosting our application. I've prepared two proxies, STCP for secure communication via FRP server and XTCP, the peer-to-peer -peer one. Now you may be wondering, why do we need two proxies? Technically we don't. The STCP proxy is just a fallback. If peer-to-peer -peer communication isn't possible, maybe not whole punching fails, the connection automatically falls back to STCP. Let's start by running the FRP client. Next, we launch our application, which in this case is iperf. Here's the client configuration. You'll notice we have two visitors, one for STCP, the fallback, and one for XTCP, the peer-to-peer -peer option. For the XTCP setup, everything looks almost identical to STCP, but there are two key differences. We have the keep tunnel open parameter, which sends periodical keep alive to prevent the tunnel from closing. There's also a fallback setting. If we can't establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection within 200 milliseconds, it switches to STCP mode. By default, FRP uses the STAN easyvoip.com as the STAN server, but you can change this to any STAN server you prefer. All right, let's go ahead and start the FRP client. Success. Not hole punching worked, and node 1 and node 2 are now directly connected. Let's start the iperf test. Look at that. We are no longer limited by the bandwidth of the FRP server, since node 1 and node 2 are connected directly via a UDP tunnel. Thanks for watching. We've covered a lot in this video, focusing on some of the basics of FRP. While we didn't dive into TCP multiplexing or SSH proxies or explore HTTP and HTTPS proxies, it's worth noting that FRP can efficiently route traffic to different VMs based on HTTP host header or URLs. It also supports SSL offloading, header rewriting and authentication, among other features. We demonstrated a TCP tunnel between an FRP client and server, but uh, you can also utilize a Quick or KCP protocols, both of which are built on top of UDP. We didn't touch the installation either, but it's straightforward. Just download the binary from GitHub and you can find example systemd startup scripts to help you get started. In short, I believe FRP is an incredibly versatile tool with a lot of potential for your projects. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more insightful content. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. I'd love to help. Thanks again for watching and see you next time.